Hello and welcome back to our conversations with Christine and Jillian about raising socially conscious children. I'm Christine and I'm an early childhood educator and mom of a teen and a almost teen. So a preteen turning to teen. So I'll have two teens. Um, and Jillian has three children under the age of six. Woo. Yeah. So we like to um, talk together. We find each other talking with each other about um, how we want to be in the world as parents and raising our children so that they are open and allies in this world. So today, Jillian, we were going to talk about self-care. Um, and this is such a word that or term that we're hearing everywhere, self-care. And we're kind of turning the tables on ourselves today and talking about maybe being a little vulnerable about how as parents we have um, turned and tried to make self-care strategy in our parenting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, as soon as you said the word vulnerable, it like brought up for me something that I want to share is, which is like, as we talk through the way that we care for ourselves. Um, I do want to acknowledge that I am not a patient person by nature, that all of the patience that I'm able to show to my children is very hard one. Like I work for it. I strive for it and it doesn't come easy. It often comes at the expense of other people who get like my ire because I lose patience with them because I'm trying to be so patient for my children because I want to model for them how to be patient and compassionate and full of grace and generous because I want them to be that way with other people. Um, so I have to model that. So it takes a lot for me to, to get to that place where I can be like that, like 95% of the time and only use my yelling voice like that other 5%. I, I have a yelling voice. I've, I've had it. I cannot say, you know, 15 years old is my oldest. Um, but I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because um, I think one of maybe that false idea that uh, women, especially caregivers, parents, um, should be, um, this should be easy and this should come naturally that we just um, get on the floor and, and, and be patient and play and giggle and laugh. And um, that, that's 99% of our time. And uh, it's interesting because when I, I, I'd also like to acknowledge that I am uh, living in a system that does support me. And as I'm, I'm a full-time working mom and have been, um, and that I am, you know, a white educated person in the world. So I know that the system, or I'm trying to acknowledge that the system really works for me um, in the sense of I'm supported in so many ways. Um, but I really like to reach out to people today who are parents in, in similar situations. And that, um, that doesn't mean that parenting is easy. And so it, it can be um, hard. I had this baby and I was an early childhood educator and I thought, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and it took my husband to say, you know, this is not an early childhood educator. It's a, a, a parent job. And again, great to have a partner who's, who's helpful that way. But the, the idea that the role was so much bigger, so much bigger. Um, it's, it's nonstop. It's relentless. That's the word I use when I think about parenting. It's relentless. It, it, it goes on all day, all night, and into the next day and into the next night forever. <laughs> And I think there's something really good about being real about it. When we, we, two people like us can say that to each other. Right. Right. And the, if, when, if we're thinking about the system, right. And you had mentioned this, that, that, you know, you can't just bark self-care at people for who the system that should be responsible for caring for you. In our case, the system is caring for us. We, we have those privileges where um, we have a lot of support. And sometimes when I'm in that moment where I'm at my like most impatient or my natural rage is like boiling over and I, I want to totally lose it or I'm in the middle of totally losing it. I really think about how, how lucky I am 
mm-hmm. to have a lot of safeguards in between wh- where what I'm feeling and actually getting into a position where I'm likely to hurt my child, mm-hmm. right? Like I, I have um, a certain level of a lower level of ongoing stress because I'm not financially um, in uncertain terms all the time. I'm not, I have a lot of support around me. I'm not alone. I've got a spouse who supports me and my parents, my parents style. I have a mother who lives with us and offers support um, with our child rearing, with household chores, responsibilities. And I have the education and background that I have in early childhood. So I can understand some of the behaviors that are happening or what, you know, what are the reasons that this, this child, what's this child going through in their brain right now as they're having this behavior? I have all of that and I still lose my cool. Right. So then it, when the system is working for me and I still have that those challenges, how much harder is it for people for whom the system is not working for them? The system puts pressure and pressure and, and, and oppresses them and keeps them away from access to resources. Um, those folks have a lot more to battle against when they're thinking about self-care and the way that they have time for self-care, money for self-care. Um, so I want to be really real about that too, is like, there are a lot of things that apart from the way that I care for myself, that keep me at a place where I can try to be my best self for my children. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like how you, um, made that clear because it is something that I'm able to do because I feel supported in, in, in many areas, um, of the system in general, but it does come to, um, a parent's need to care for themselves so that they are able to care for others. And it's very much that, that scenario, that idea of the airplane and the oxygen mask coming down. And I, I love this um, analogy because, um, and it's used in so many pieces of our field, but it's the idea that the adult needs to put on their mask before they can help the child. We need the adult ready and able to be able to care for that child. So and what, it, you, what were your self-care strategies when your kids were younger and how have they evolved as you, as you've grown to them into teenagers? <laughs> well, now we get vulnerable because I don't think I was very aware when they were babies and toddlers um, about putting myself first. Um, and not first my care first. And maybe that was the difference. I thought I was putting myself first or not first, but really I was so busy, uh, mine are two years apart. Um, and I really was in the flow of it and I enjoyed, I do enjoy early childhood. I love preschoolers. I love toddlers, but, um, 24 seven is a lot working full time. Um, and so, um, one of the things that as I look back, I might not have been aware of it then, that I, I did try to create a, a schedule that met the children's needs, but allowed me to have time by myself when they went to bed. And um, I did keep it, people could tease me a bit on it, it was an early bedtime for most, um, but my children were very used to it and very much taken to it. And it gave me a nice kind of hour to hours to myself later on at night. Um, and I realized that maybe I wasn't aware of it then and could tell people that strategy, um, that it was a self-care strategy then, but now I realize it, it really was. Um, it helped the children as well. Their sleep patterns really met that, but um, it really was self-care as well. So as they got older, it became, can, can they join me if I can't, you know, be gone in self-care? Could we take walks? Could we get outside? Could I bring them to a playground and sit back on the bench while they play and kind of take in the trees or nature or um, notice that I don't need to be on top of them at the age that was appropriate then? So it does move and it does shift. And um, I think now with teenagers, I was just joking um, about how they get up so early as toddlers and you just wish and wish and wish they'd sleep in. And that coffee's so 
important sometimes if you're a coffee drinker when you get up that early with young ones. And now the circle has um, come to where the teenagers sleep in so long sometimes that I hope they keep sleeping because now I'm having this morning time alone. Um, again, it is what I'm noticing in the moment. So it's, it's evolved and it does kind of get based off of what's going on with them. But I have to find those little times where maybe I can sneak in that time, whether it's to read a book or just have coffee and nobody asks me a question or needs something from me. Right. And it sounds a little bit like, uh, like using some mindfulness strategies, like not necessarily like having a mindfulness moment or meditating, just being aware that like sitting on a bench at a park when your children are at an age where they don't need you to support them, just like some light supervision, like that is a moment of, of peace where you could let your mind be your own. Absolutely. Outside is a great, a great outlet for, for me personally. Mm -hmm. Um, And as they're growing kids, we know if we can get them to safe places and um, spots where they can kind of get themselves moving, it's, it's really important for them as well. How about you with twins who are toddlers? Yeah. Yes. That early bedtime thing is really real. Um, I'm right there. My kids are asleep by seven o'clock every night. Um, my twins, my, my six-year-old is not, but he still knows like what the expectation is. And I'm pretty frank with him. Like on nights when he's pushing bedtime and trying to stall, I will say like, I am done. Like I'm logging off for the day of parenting. So if you have trouble going to sleep, don't, don't come see me about it. Like you stay in your bed. You've got all your books. You've got your stuff to look at. Like I'm, I'm done. And of course, if he does need me, like if he needs to go to the bathroom or he's upset about something, like I'm still there, but I, I try to be truthful with him about like what my time means to me. Like I've been caring for you all day and now it's my time to get some rest that I can be patient and loving to you again tomorrow. Um, so good night. I'll see you in the morning, but the, you know, getting my twins to bed by seven really is, I was not this way with, with my oldest son when he was a baby, like he had a much later bedtime. We co-slept. We had, you know, I would snuggle him to sleep every night. And that's just not possible with my twins. Like I just, I didn't have the capacity when they were little to be able to physically be there with both of them in the way that they both needed given their different needs. Um, and so it became very clear that I had to have a, a, a much more structured routine and the benefits are really like it pays in dividends for real. Like they, they have this sleep schedule. They're more independent. They sleep differently than each other, but they both know, like, even when they wake up in the morning that we're not coming to get them until a certain time, like they're awake playing in their cribs when they're talking to each other, just like playing with the zipper on their jammies. Um, they don't even ask to be gotten until we've surpassed the time that they expect us because we are getting our older son up and, and you know, getting him ready to leave for school. Mm-hmm we're just not available to them yet. And they know, and that's, that's a little like having that routine, like you said, is the self-care in itself, like making sure that the children have a routine that is predictable to me and to them gives me a chance to set myself up for success for them. Yeah. Uh, I've got my own little routines built in there. Like I got things that I do before anybody wakes up, the things they do once they're woken up, like there's, everything is pretty structured in a way that it never used to be when I had one child. And certainly not when I didn't have any kids where I was rolling out of bed minutes before I needed to leave the house because I could do that. Now it's like, I'm awake four hours before anything real happens during the day. Um, But another, like one of my, my most treasured pieces of self-care is the time that I spend with other people. Mm. And that's not even like physically in person, right? Because it's not possible for us right now. Mm-hmm. But um, the the way that I use social media to connect with others, that I've got, you know, like text chains that I have with friends and, and um, connecting with people on Facebook, sharing pictures, looking at pictures of other people's children. Um, those things matter a lot to me. And I know that there's this sort of stereotype of, people of my generation, like parenting on their phones all the time and how the kids feel like neglected because you're looking at your phone. But like, I don't know. I don't think that's really true. I think that like, I'm a more fulfilled parent because I have an outlet for my own thoughts and feelings throughout the day. So if I'm frustrated with my kid or with my partner, I can just shoot that off in a quick message to a friend, get it off my chest and move on. Um, 
be useful to them when they're having a hard time, right? Being kind to people helps you feel better. Um, so having those types of interactions in an ongoing accessible way in my hand throughout the day is a form of self-care for me. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean I'm neglecting my children. I can neglect my children without my phone in my hand if I wanted to, but like I can also pleasantly supervise them and engage with them in a loving way while I'm having a conversation with a friend. Um, it's I like that. Zoom conversations with my, with my friends. Um, it, all those little things help take me out of my, my mom brain for long enough to feel like I am a whole person. And I can remember like that I have a whole life outside of these tiny little people who, who need so much. Yeah. All the time, (laughs) all the time, relentlessly. Right. Relentlessly. I think, um, this, the pandemic as well with, um, being together more often. Um, and for the age group, you know, children I have teenagers aren't usually with their parents 24 seven. Um, so there's, uh, there's a, a difference in, you know, the, the interactions that we have because they weren't able to see friends for so long or, mm-hmm. um, face to face and do all the developmental things that you're supposed to do when you're that age. Um, and I think that's been a challenge for people who have, you know, older children who typically would be off at school and we're really kind of facing this. I'm on much longer than I normally would be as, as mom and setting those clear boundaries. I think I remember saying very similar things. I'm glad you brought that up to about your older son when you said, you know, this is now my time. I, you're you're going to be able to do what you need in bed. Again, obviously that he's safe and not upset and those kinds of things. But really letting someone know your own personal boundaries that you, you get to have time to yourself, that you get to have time where you feel tired and you need to recharge. So that's a little bit of modeling and it's a little bit of... Um, allowing our children to hear that we have boundaries because when we can't say no or show that something kind of does have a stop sign in it, um, how will they know to do it for themselves? How will they know to respect that in other people, friends, future partners, whatever? You know, you're so, so right. And I feel like this is the perfect stopping point because you're about to get me going on boundaries and consent. And that should be our next conversation. Okay. Um, but yes, I think that ultimately like you nailed it, like self-care is about boundaries. What boundaries do you have for yourself as a parent, as a person? Mm. And do you help make sure that the people around you are able to, to understand and respect what your boundaries are. So I think that as we close for today, like I want to put that challenge out for all of you, like what are your boundaries and how are you communicating that to your children and to the other people who are helping you parent? Um, We're just starting to notice it for yourself because sometimes you're not, it's not as clear to you if you haven't practiced it before. I'm still figuring it out sometimes. I'm like, I don't know what's going on with me, but I think I need a minute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And you realize, oh, that boundary is what I needed to say. It was a boundary. All right. I like that. And then we'll jump into something. I like the, the next step too. So thank you for sharing the way we are just all trying to find a way to have that moment for ourselves in self-care. Just trying to find a way. Yep. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next time.